Emma Mitchell marks it. She's been uh, a tower of strength, although tower is perhaps not the word you should use for somebody of five foot three. And so Karen Amund, the captain, uh, will go for touch here. That's well struck. That may be the try that will seal the World Cup fate. That's Jill Burns. Fantastic game she's had. More and more women are playing what's always been seen as very much a man's sport, and the standard of play is improving all the time. I take a lot of pride from knowing that being one of those early players who pulled pints behind the bar or worked at the shop at Saracen so as we could set up a women's side there was what the game needed at the time in order to just start to get a foothold and then to grow. A lot of the people that I know now know that I play rugby and they accept it as something I do. A lot of people who haven't heard of women's rugby obviously they take the sweating first but normally if they come and watch a game especially a standard of today's game then um, they um, usually change their opinion. They have an attitude before they even get there, but you just had to get them through the gate to watch a game to change the attitude. So that was kind of where we were at, really. I mean, I can remember one chap at my own club, Waterloo, he just kept trying to stop me from playing, saying it's, it's just wrong that ladies play the game. He ended up being one of our biggest fans at the, at, you know, at the rugby club, and, and we converted him from a, a non-believer into somebody who said, my goodness, you know, my eyes have been opened and women's rugby is a great thing. So that's what we just tried to do, slowly but surely, uh, win across the doubters. Excitement and nerves, that mix that, you know, you know when you've got that, that you're, you're sort of definitely heading into a big game and probably the most nervous I'd, I'd ever been for a, an international game and obviously I imagine understandably because it was a first World Cup final, but just trying to remember what my role was and know what I needed to try and do. privilege as it was to take part in that first final. Uh, we were a little bit naive compared with the, the very fit and, and, and streetwise American team. We were as prepared as we could be with the limited sort of times we met up and the limited opportunities we had to train together. We were as good as we could be at that time but we were just going in with enthusiasm, a love of the game and support, you know, we, we had the greatest team around us helping us to, to be there. But yeah, it was more excitement that first time because it was something completely different and a pleasure to be part of. Early on it just felt like this is going to plan, that you know we're playing how we want to play and how we need to play and it's resulting in, in points. It didn't in any way get overconfident but just felt yeah keep doing it, the, the, the plan is working. in the battle uh, we played we were playing well you know it was an even game but as I said before the Americans were a little bit more streetwise and, and perhaps a tad fitter across the board the Americans were athletes who had learned how to play rugby a lot of them and um, and they certainly towards the end of the game they they were able to still keep moving at quite a pace and we were tired. They had a very talented back line um, and again, you know, that started to tell. So there were more and more turnovers um, where we were losing ball and perhaps not able to control the game in the way we wanted. And they most definitely wanted to play at a faster pace. And again, good line out work. Terrific play by Tara Flanagan. The support is there again. And Patty Connell has got the third try for the USA.
devastating is probably the, the word I would use to sum it up. We were very unhappy. We were very unhappy that, that we'd lost. However, we respected our opponents. They were better than us on the day and they deserved the win. We had something to aspire to and something to build towards for the next World Cup. The 94 tournament was due to be hosted by the Netherlands um, in Amsterdam. The IRB weren't going to sanction the tournament. They hadn't sanctioned 91. There's no real expectation that they were going to sanction 94, but what that meant was the Dutch Union said, well, actually, if it's not sanctioned by the IRB, we are not going to host it. We were just pretty much in despair because we'd worked almost three years um, and committed to something, um, and it was literally going to be taken away. Scotland's women rugby players have been telling of how they've rescued the World Cup. The Women's World Championship was due to be staged in Holland this April, but after the Dutch cancelled, the Scottish Union has stepped in at the last minute. But I don't know the full details as to why they, they stepped down, but I would suggest it was something to do with the funding issue. And thankfully, Sue Brodie and her team up in Scotland decided that I think they were very keen to get their Scotland team on the map as well. And, and if the girls from England could do it for the first World Cup, I think Sue and her team decided, well, let's do it in, in Edinburgh as well. So they did a fantastic job. And I think all of us who played in that tournament will be forever grateful for that group of players and volunteers who, who made it happen. Those early years, it was about we, we will make it happen ourselves and, and again that group that's what they did. In the early days we had to literally pay for ourselves and stay in youth hostels and have duties of cleaning the day after you know so I remember cleaning toilets and all that kind of thing. We were all given uh, like raffle tickets to sell to raise money to fund ourselves to go so that the more raffle tickets you sold the, the less money you had to pay. I know we paid for our own hotel accommodation um, and we made, a, once again, a collective decision as a squad that we wanted to stay somewhere special. We decided to stay in the George in Edinburgh because that's where England men stayed when they won the Rugby Sevens World Cup, I think, the year before. So we thought if it's a hotel for England winners, we'll, we'll fund it ourselves. The bill for the hotel, I've still got the receipt in my photo album. But some of the sacrifices you make because you, you have a dream and, and you've got to make things happen. <laughs> The main reasons we felt we didn't do as well in 91 was because we were very concentrated on a small group of players and we didn't have the strength in depth so I think for those three years in between we'd really worked hard to increase the depth and therefore an opportunity to rest players, rotate players, give players experience so that if someone key player got injured we had someone that could come in and was used to playing at that level so I had to sit out the first game against Scotland and I think I also sat out the game against Russia and that was really hard for me because I had never sat out a game before and been on the bench. From the start, England's much vaunted pack made its formidable imprint on the game, stealing the rock ball here and the kick ahead from standoff Karen Almond, creating territorial pressure. England totally dominant in the last quarter and now showing confident handling skills. And once the ball is worked back, it's Armand again, gaining ground with some clever kicking ahead and demonstrating yet another one of her many skills. But there was one last impressive exhibition to come from the 31-year-old teacher as she showed the French just how much speed she possessed. A superb break from Armand, clean through to the line. A wonderful try, it was converted for an 18-6 lead. They're through to the final with no hint of an inferiority complex as they face up to a formidable American back division. 
Well, we've got quite a fast pack division as well. <laughs> uh, we're looking forward to it. I mean, obviously, we've played America a couple of times. We've lost one and won one. Uh, the lot one loss being the World Cup final. So we know how to play them, and we're certainly not intending giving them any time in the backs to do their fancy stuff. I've watched the video of us walking out that day, and our, we were so focused and so switched on for that game. We knew we had a job to do because America were probably the favourites. They had an, an amazing, an amazing set of backs, but we knew we had the strength to counter it because we had an amazing set of forwards and our backs were, well, we thought we were pretty good too. So, you know, on the whole, we knew we could do it, but we had to do it in a certain way. And so the scene is set here at Rayburn Place, the old international ground from last century. What would the spectators of yesteryear think of this event today? And immediately there is a sign of intent from the Americans as they run and this is Jen Crawford blazing out of defence. There is a sign of things, great support from Connell, the scrum half, as the English forwards have to retreat. It is not forward and that went down rather well with the crowd. I remember between the semi-final and the final in the, the George Hotel where the team was staying, we, we didn't have access to a team meeting room so we would meet in the bar um, and we sat around the... the pool table which was boarded up on top and Steve Dowling had us all sat around the table and uh, he said we we've watched the USA and we know exactly how we're going to beat them and I, I can remember the whole group of us just leaning into him across this pool table they knew that from the US Wales semi-final that the US forwards were struggling a little bit in some of that tight play, particularly the scrummage play, and that that was one of our strengths, our forwards, and they were a fearsome bunch and, and really up for the job. That's big Joe Burns, number eight, with the control. And they're going and going and going, and is this the pushover? A penalty try has been given. This time the strike is clean from Ponsford. Again, it's held by Burns. Again, they go forward. And it's almost a rampage now. They're going, can they control it? The whistle goes, and it's a penalty. And in fact, a penalty try again. I was just incredibly proud of the forward pack we had and the display they put on. I mean, scrummaging is part of the game, and if you've got an, an advantage there, you look to use it. I mean, we scored two back tries in that game as well, and we, we, we didn't just keep the ball in the forwards. It wasn't 10-man rugby. We sort of, I think, played clever. And away comes Emma Mitchell, there's a chance here for Armand. And a terrific chance here to strangle. And another one for Mitchell, and it's a great try. Jane Mitchell with a cracker try. She's congratulated by her twin sister, Emma. What a good try for England. They're that close. They've had two penalty tries. They wouldn't mind a third. They would just say thank you very much. Burns, the try is given. Jim Fleming's not worried about that. Oh, great catch there. And an interception. As the same try from Jackie Edwards, she's been closed down by McFerrin, but she scored the try. And that will do it. That indeed will do it. Jim Fleming blows for no side. England celebrates. They have won the cup. And they are the world champions. They have defeated the United States Eagles this afternoon at Rayburn Place. The picture tells the story. The English forwards dominated, they did the deed, and uh, the American backs, thrilling as they were, could do little about it. I can still remember it as clear as a bell as if it was yesterday. We didn't have big stadiums and podiums and fireworks and, you know, all that going on, but it was still the same feeling. Holding that trophy up was one of the proudest moments of my life, really. incredible feeling. It was the three years of hard work, the relief because of the expectation that we had of ourselves and of the, of the group. Um, and then quickly that went to euphoria. We'd, we'd had that dream from 1991. We knew that one day we might be able to do it and, and to actually have that World Cup in your hands is a, a truly special thing and one I will always treasure. Well, we hope it's a springboard now. I mean, now that England have actually won it, um, hopefully there'll be a lot more promotion and girl, a lot more girls will start playing the game because, you know, the girls of today are the stars of tomorrow.
I think I think back in the early days it was very much a novelty. Oh, women are playing rugby. Oh, we'll go along and see. You know, can they actually play? And then when they came and watched, and they they most of them left impressed and were like, well, you can actually play. It's just the same game. And we'd be like, yeah, well, <laughs> we we know that. It's just been a very long, slow process to, to win across the doubters and to foster respect from people who just couldn't imagine it happening. Yeah, there was a lot of attitudes back then to um, the fact that it was a man's game and why do women want to play a man's game? And really the answer always had been, but it's a game that we love just as much as men love. Why should they be keeping it to themselves? Why can't we play it? There's no reason why we can't play it. And then we get a lot of, but you're not as good as the men, you guys. You can't kick it as well. You can't tackle as well. You can't run as fast. And then we'd always say, but we're not trying to. We're not trying to compete with the men. We just want to play a game we love to the best of our ability. The old fashioned ideas die out. Uh, and you know, and, and look where we are today with women's sport in general and the, the Red Roses are so well supported and the little bit inside me is, is wondering what our squad could have become, wondering what sort of athletes we could have become, wondering, wondering how high the standards could have been if we'd been given the opportunity to be full time together. Um, it would be wonderful to know that, however, the time we did it was special being part of that sort of pioneering group. We didn't know we were pioneers at the time, but being part of that group and trying to prove to people that, you know what, it's, it's our game too. It's lovely to know the connection that, that now goes through the you know, very early Red Roses from Karen at, at Red Rose number one, all the way through to, I don't know where we are now, we must be close to 300. To just see that, that sort of legacy continued and to know that we had a role to play early on I was privileged to get an MBE in 2005 and the Queen had so had a great conversation with me. She knew a lot about my career and she was chatting about refereeing at Twickenham and how many games I'd played and being captain and she was just a, a delight to, to chat to and then she said, I'm sorry to say though I've not seen a ladies game live and I said, well ma'am, it's a very good game and the boys kept it to themselves for far too long and she laughed and said indeed. So. The whole fun of, of it being considered a boys game and now it's not and that journey to get to where we are today, I really wouldn't change any of it.